Well, it's already been a great day, amen? Great day to celebrate our faith as we baptized Tobin Schwartz, a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, and now ministry partner of Florence Christian Church. Tobin has been nurtured by his wonderful family, all of you here today for him, it's wonderful, and friends from other churches, it's just wonderful to have everybody here today. And also by us, Tobin's church family at Florence Christian, um, you all have, we've all known him since he started this life on this earth. And your family has loved you, Tobin, from that very first day and even before, and so have we. And so I was just telling Tobin, when I, when I first came to this church in 2015, he was only three years old. And so to see him grow up and um, become this young man that he is, is, is just a joy. And so for all of us who have been here today, who've been on this journey of faith a bit longer than you have, Tobin, we can affirm that the day of our baptism, which for you today, was not the end, but really a beginning. It was really a beginning of our lifetime of growing in faith and understanding of what the call to follow Jesus really means. And I'm grateful that we are reminded through our sermon series, The Seven Habits for Highly Effective Disciples, based on Stephen Covey's best-selling book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, that we are not perfect disciples, we are not successful disciples. We are not efficient disciples. That's not what we are called to be. We are called to be effective disciples of Jesus Christ. And that doesn't happen in an instant. It doesn't happen when we go under the waters of baptism and come out. We're not all there yet, but we are in the process of developing those habits in our lives over our lifetimes. And now as we prepare to consider these habits that can lead us into more effectiveness for Jesus Christ and living that life that he calls us to, I want to invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Loving and gracious God, we give you our thanks today for your presence that is always with us from the time we take our first breath to the time we take our last. And all that is in between. And so, God, I pray this morning as we think about our lives and how we can become more effective, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh God, are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Seven Habits for Highly Effective Disciples. I want to take just a moment to review the three habits we've looked at so far um, that take us to today. The first one, habit one, is to be proactive. Reverend Diop reminded us that to be proactive means to actively be preparing ourselves through daily spiritual practices so that when you and I are faced with the challenges of life, and we all will be, we will be able to respond to those in faith rather than react to them out of fear and lack of faith. Um, times that are challenging will happen in all of our lives. And so we need to be proactive by trying to enter into those spiritual practices or disciplines that help us to move deeper in our relationship with God. Then we looked at habit two, begin with the end in mind, when I talked about the importance of considering the cost of discipleship. Uh, as we think about not only how we plan for this day, you know, how are we going to end this day in which we're living, but also the longer term plans and goals that we have for our lives as followers of Jesus and how our lives and those goals will align with the way that Jesus showed us to live. So um, that was the second one. Last week, we looked at habit three, putting first things per first, when Reverend Stevens talked about the importance of seeking first God's realm and righteousness and how making that a priority in our lives before anything else can keep us free from worry, one of the chief blocks to experiencing peace and abundance in our lives. So as you can see, these first three habits are all about looking within ourselves, doing that deep internal work through spiritual practice that is necessary for us to experience life abundant 
and will also equip us for the developing the next three habits, habits which lead us from ourselves into our relationships with others. Today we're going to look at habit four, which is think win-win. Now I want to begin by saying that those of you who know me, even a little bit maybe, know that I am a pretty competitive person. <laughs> I mean, I like to win. I do not like to lose, whether it is a board game or pretty much anything else. In fact, this past week at our General Assembly of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, I have to confess that I was on a real high <laughs> that Florence Christian Church won the James P. Johnson Award for Excellence in Stewardship. And here's a picture of the group that went down for that together. I was so proud of our church and the accomplishments through mission and outreach and the decisions that we have made to ensure that our mission will continue in perpetuity. But what some of you might not know is that in July of 2015, think back, July 2015, just seven months after beginning our ministry here, Pastor Diana and I were sitting at the foundation dinner at the General Assembly, and after seeing another church recognized with this award, I turned to Diana and I said, I want Florence Christian Church to win the James P. Johnson Pastoral Ministry Award, and I want to do it while I'm a pastor here. And it happened. Boom. Thanks be to God. That was great. Yeah, I like to win. I like to win. Even when it's not just my accomplishment, but ours. And I think that's not just me. I think that most of us want to win. Because it feels good to win, right? Not only to win awards, but to achieve goals that were, are, are important to us. Celebrating milestones. Celebrating anniversaries and graduations and promotions and baptisms, achieving, winning. It feels really, really good. But when you and I focus only on winning, we sometimes set ourselves up against others. Sometimes if I win, it means somebody else is going to lose. And if someone else wins, it may mean that I lose. And more times than not, we all lose when we insist on our own way. When we think, win, lose. I'm right. You're wrong. I win. You lose. Chapter 14 from Paul's letter to the Romans is about a conflict that is going on between those that he calls the strong and the weak. And to us, it might seem pretty trivial because this conflict is about food and festivals. But as Dr. Mary Hinkle Shore writes, if you and I were to look at the entirety of Paul's writings, his letters to the churches, we would know that this subject was a topic that went around the bend a few times in the early church. We see it especially in the letter to the Galatians, where Paul writes that he went off on Peter... Remember the story? He went off on Peter for withdrawing from table fellowship with Gentiles. And this happened, if you remember the book of Acts, where Peter has this amazing encounter with God, and he's told that Gentiles should be welcome at the table. And Peter says, oh, I've never done anything with unclean people or unclean things. And God says, what, what God has called clean, you must not call unclean. And Peter's gone around touting this. And then he withdraws from table fellowship with Gentiles. And so Paul gets on to him about that. And then later in that same letter, Paul voices strong opposition to the Galatians themselves for observing special days and months and seasons and years. And if we didn't know these passages from Galatians, it would be easy for us to read our text for today from Romans chapter 14 and say, food and festivals, so what? But in Romans, Paul offers the advice that people should welcome each other and not judge different convictions. And even though we would quickly say amen to that, we might stiffen up when we have struggles with each other over ethical and moral choices. Things like sexuality 
and abortion, whether the wars that we are fighting are just, or what the arrival of immigrants means for our communities, just to name a few. Yeah, most of us would hardly notice if somebody <laughs> tabled a few dishes, labeled a few dishes vegetarian in the next church potluck. Reading our text in isolation might make us think that it really has nothing to say to us when we struggle with these church-dividing issues. And yet Galatians makes it clear that at least in one context, these seemingly inconsequential issues actually threatened both the life of the church and the gospel. You see, ten years before Paul wrote the letter to the Romans— Food and festivals were huge issues in the church. A decade or so later, what he it was so combative about in the letter to the Galatians, here he is instead exhorting his Roman readers to welcome one another across different opinions and practices on the same issues. And so we have to ask the question, what changed? What changed? Well, actually, a couple of things. Ten years earlier in Galatia, the teachers there, after Paul had established the church and left, the teachers who were still there were requiring certain Jewish practices related to food and other things like circumcision as a prerequisite for becoming a Christian. In Rome, this was not the case. No one was attempting to substitute the uh, observation of certain days and abstaining from uh, eating meat for the saving work of Christ. And so the question that Romans 14 answers seems to be something like this. When no one is claiming another Savior besides Jesus, or is leaning on a source of righteousness besides the righteousness of Christ, and yet the church disagrees, what should we do? The answer Paul gives is to welcome one another and to put up with each other's failings. And since everyone would have, they would have read this, would probably have thought they were the strong ones rather than the weak ones. And those who, you know, have the truth and those who just don't get it yet, it resonates with all of the church. Because they all think they're the strong ones, right? The other thing that I want us to consider is this. And this is one that I really feel strongly about. By the time Paul is writing this letter to the Roman church, I want us to remember that he is still growing in his faith. He is still maturing. He's still becoming and learning about what it means to follow Jesus and what the church should be. And because of that, Paul has grown to have a more nuanced view. So much so that in this chapter, in Romans chapter 14, he provides three reasons for his advice to bear with those who think differently and act differently on matters of belief and practice. And I think this would be helpful for us to consider today as we think about our own differences in the church. The first one is found in verse 6, and this is what it says. Those who observe the day, honor it, observe it in an honor of the Lord. Also, those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. Even though their practice may seem silly or just plain wrong to others of the same faith in Jesus Christ, when people eat or abstain, when they observe a day or they ignore it, Paul recognizes that they are nonetheless seeking by their actions to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's second reason is related to the first Christians bear with one another, not only because all are trying by their actions to honor Christ, but also because Christ is, in fact, Lord of all, all the time. Let's look at verses 7 and 8 together. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord, so that whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Paul has come to recognize that Christ died and rose in order to create community across the most fundamental of differences. Jews and Greeks, slave and free, male and female, dead and living, Christ is Lord 
of all. The third reason Paul gives for bearing with those whose practice differs from our own or his own is that God is the judge. And there's only one judge, amen? We don't get to be the judge. Instead, as disciples of Jesus, we are focused on our relationship with God and our relationship with each other through Christ. And then you and I are called to trust God will do what God will do. Now, what does this mean? What does all this have to do with habit four, the habit of think win-win? Well, it seems to me from this teaching that win-lose is not an option for the follower of Jesus. It's not an option. And true winning does not happen in isolation. And that's because, as you well know, we have been created for community. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we are the body of Christ. We, the church, are the representation, the representation of Jesus Christ in the world. And if that is so, we will live the truth that Jesus lived. And that is that God is primarily and wholly love. And love as 1 Corinthians 13 reminds us, does not insist on its own way. No, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. In Christ, love abides. Love never fails. When all is said and done, love wins. At the General Assembly this past week, we explored the theme, the kingdom of God. You see, some pe people thought we just made a mistake there. They, they actually, the youth had bags and, and the printer changed it. But that was, not, that was not intended. The kingdom of God, the relationship with God that we are called to live into with God and with each other. So... This kingdom, this love that God has for us to experience with one another and with God. We start with the first three, uh, three habits, right? Which is working on that love in us with our relationship with God. And then we're now going out to others. How do we respond to others? And the first night of the assembly, U.S. Army Chaplain Major Owen Chandler offered the opening worship service where he was talking about the power of love in his ministry on the battlefield of Afghanistan. And he shared how his commanding officer would talk with his leadership of their battalion with a mantra. His commander said, do the right thing first. Do the right thing always, and we'll figure out the rest. Do the right thing first. Do the right thing always, and we'll figure out the rest. And so, as Owen thought about his command of chaplains, which he had a group of chaplains working for him, and their ministry to soldiers who were struggling with the horrors of war in the midst of precarious circumstances, he developed his own mantra. He said, love first, love always, we'll figure out the rest. Love first, love always and then we'll figure out the rest. And that was his message not only to those with whom he had authority over, but his message to us as the church. To recognize that in the midst of differences of opinion, of struggles surrounding things like politics and what justice looks like for those who were without power, maybe for those who we might consider weak, my job and Tobin's job and the followers of Jesus Christ, who you all are, job is this. Love first. Love always. And we'll figure out the rest as we go and do. In Jesus' name.